Data distributions differ not only in location of their center, but also how much spread or variation there is around that center point. For example, a new drug might promise an average of 25% better results than its competition. But does that mean that 25% of patients improved 100%? Or does that mean that everybody got 25% better? It's not clear from that central tendency. But if you're the one who's sick, you want to know. It's sometimes called a trade-off between risk and return. Now you might think, just take the average differ difference of how far observations are from the average, but that won't work. Now there's an old joke about the tenant complains to the super that in winter their apartment is 50 degrees and in summer it's 90 degrees, and the super responds, well, what are you complaining? The apartment's a comfortable 70 degrees on average. You know, the average deviation from the average is always zero. You can write out formulas to see. The average of some n values, x1, x2, all the way to xn, is, we said before, x bar, 1 over n, sum of xi. So what's the average deviation from the average? There will be some xi values that are above the mean, some below the mean, but the average will balance out. That's just what the average is defined to be. Distribute the summation through the parentheses. Since x bar is the same for each, the sum of those is n times x bar, and that's the same as the sum of the xi. We can't reuse the average. So you want to find some useful, sensible function, or functions, f, such that sum of f times xi minus x bar is not just going to be trivially equal to zero. So the most commonly reported measure of spread around the center is the standard deviation. It looks complicated because it squares the deviation and then takes a square root, but it's actually quite generally useful. Before you start to panic about the, how complicated the formula looks, we'll go through it slowly. We just said if we sum up all the terms, we get nothing. The positive errors and negative errors cancel out. So we square the differences, square those deviations, and divide by n to get the average squared deviation, which we call the variance and represent with sigma squared. But those units are bonkers to interpret, so we take the square root of the variance, which is just plain sigma. Now, of course, you're asking, well, why bother to square all the parts inside the summation if we're only going to take the square root afterwards? But it's worthwhile to understand the rationale. Similar questions will reoccur. The point of the squared error is that they do not cancel out. In terms of the math rules, you remember that a plus b quantity squared is not equal generally to a squared plus b squared. We've got to take first, outer, inner, last. If we sum over more terms, a plus b plus c, blah, 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 quantity squared, then that's not going to be equal to just some nice terms. Now the variance and standard deviation of the population divide by n, the variance and standard deviation of a sample divide by n minus 1. This is referred to as degrees of freedom correction, referring to the fact that a sample after calculating the mean has lost one degree of freedom. The standard deviation has only n minus df remaining. You could worry about that difference or note that for a lot of data sets with huge n, like the BRFSS we're using with over 400,000, the difference is too tiny to worry about. Notation generally uses Greek letters to denote population values and English letters for sample values. So we'll have s squared and s in place of sigma squared and sigma. As you learn more statistics, you'll see the standard deviation appears quite often. Hopefully you'll begin to get used to it. We could look at other functions of the distance of the data from the central measure, other f, such that sum of f of x minus x bar is not going to be zero. And for example, could use the absolute value. Recall the graphs of those two functions, you can begin to appreciate how they differ. One there is a parabola, and the other is just a straight line with an angle at the right at zero. Squaring the distance counts large deviations much worse than small deviations, whereas absolute value deviation does not. So if you're trying to hit a central target, it might make sense. Wider and wider misses should be penalized worse, while tiny misses maybe get hardly counted. There is a relationship between the distance measure we select and the central parameter. 
For example, suppose I want to find some number w that minimizes a measure of distance of that number w from each of the observations. So I want to minimize sum over n f of x minus w. If you use the absolute value function, then setting w to the median would minimize the distance. If we use the squared function, then setting it to the average would minimize the difference. So there's an important connection between the average and the standard deviation, just as there's a connection between the median and the absolute deviation. If you know calculus, you'll understand why in the age before computer calculations, statisticians preferred the squared difference to the absolute value of the difference. If we look for an estimator that will minimize that distance, then in general, in order to minimize something, we take its derivative. Derivative of the absolute value, however, is undefined at zero, while the squared distance is a nice, easy derivative. So now, with so much computing power available these days, many people wonder why the average statistics, or why the available statistics, should depend so much on what some Victorian mathematician could calculate on paper. We see other measures of variations. Different textbooks go through these comprehensively. Note the coefficient of variation, s over x bar, is a reciprocal of signal to noise ratio. It's an important measure when there's no natural or physical measure. For example, a Likert scale. If you ask people to rate beer on a scale of 1 to 10 and find that consumers prefer particular ale to Budweiser by two points, you have no idea whether two is a big or a small number unless you know how much variation there is in the data, such as the standard deviation. On the other hand, if somebody tells you that, well, that costs $2 more, then you can interpret the unit dollars without a standard deviation, because dollars are a unit measure that we can understand. Sometimes we'll use standardized data, usually denoted as z, where the mean is subtracted and we divide by the standard deviation, so z is defined as each xi minus x bar divided by s. This is interpretable as measuring how many standard deviations from the mean is any particular observation. So that allows us to abstract from the particular units of the data, you know, meters or feet, Celsius or Fahrenheit, whatever, and just think of them as kind of generic numbers, unitless. It can be use, useful later when we consider causal estimates. Some treatment are, has like a two-something z-score effect, means the person being treated would be expected to jump to the 95th percentile or above. But miracle cures require substantial evidence.